Hey guys, it's Gary back again. Um, I didn't do a video last week. Um, and the weird thing was, is I should have because uh, I had two consecutive days off, which I never do with this job. Um, since I started in January, I've never had two consecutive days off. It's always one day here, one day there. Um, and I was just down. I was just feeling down for whatever reason. And um, I just couldn't bring myself to do a video. So it's been a couple weeks, I guess. Um, so t today I'm going to, let's say, make up for it. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about what I've been listening to. And it might take a little time. You know, I really wanted to do shorter videos, but it's, uh, this might be a little bit on the longer side. Okay, first I got to do a VCLT thanks from Axel in Germany sent me um, a couple things. Classic Sky, a compilation of the Sky group that had um, the classical guitarist John Williams in it. And a bunch of studio musicians, actually. It's like five, stu basically five studio musicians or four studio musicians and John Williams, a classical guitarist, including John Williams on classical guitar and an electric guitarist as well. So there's two guitars. Um, keyboards, drums, bass, all, all studio musicians. Um, and I actually bought their second album, which I can't remember. It came out 79, 80, or 81 as a new release. Um, what wasn't much in the progressive, you know, instrumental progressive band, essentially. Uh, John Williams slumming it and going into the progressive rock things at a time when, oddly enough, progressive rock had fallen out of favor. So I bought their second album when it came out. It's called Sky 2. It's a two-record set, which I still have on vinyl. Uh, a few years later, I bought one called The Great Balloon Race. John Williams had left the band. Francis Monkman, the original keyboard player, left the band, but the other guys stayed. Um, the original bass player, the electric guitarist, drummer, stayed throughout the history of the group. And so I still have their two vinyls. Um, but, um, and, and, you know, I hadn't listened to them in many years. Something caught my eye a, a few years ago. And uh, what, what they've done is that they've actually gone back and remastered the entire Sky catalog. And I think all their albums have come out now uh, with, with extras or DVDs. A lot of them have DVDs, a bunch of live performances, but it, uh, which just came out in the recent last couple of years. But maybe, maybe uh, three, four years ago, before they really started their reissue campaign, I did find, this is the only CD I have of theirs until now, actually, um, was this previously unreleased um, concert. The band started in the late 70s and only lasted to the mid-80s. Um, but this was a, a concert recording, probably for TV, because it, it runs about 51 minutes. So they must have had an hour show in the UK or somewhere, uh, featured them doing a live performance, the later day lineup, which is interesting to me, without John Williams. So just one guitarist. And they kind of uh, replaced John Williams. Instead of getting another classic guitarist, they got a... Uh, a guy that played multiple instruments, played mandolin, violin, mostly a violinist, and then was a second keyboard player for the band. So interesting sound they always had. Um, I, you know, wasn't a hardcore collector. Uh, this was interesting because this was an archival concert for TV that they released on both CD and um, DVD, which is in this package at a reasonable price. And just as a result of Axel sending me one of their best of collections, uh, including some of the tunes that I had on the two albums I have by them. It's a single disc uh, compilation, which is good to hear because if you're not going to collect everything, it's nice to have uh, at least a, you know, a compilation of things throughout the years with slightly different lineups. Um, but kind of raised, raised my interest again. I started looking on, online, and then I realized that all of their studio albums have been reissued now, remastered, bonus tracks. A lot of them have DVDs with them. Um, pretty cool, pretty cool. And so... I ended up like thinking, mm, maybe I should put these on my, in my wish list. And it was a band that I was so-so about. I liked them at times, but um, being studio musicians, I thought maybe they were a bit too precise and should let it loosen up a bit. But still, the music's really good. Um, so, you know, going back and revisiting, there's some tracks on here from the two albums I do have of theirs on vinyl that I haven't heard for years. It kind of made me want to hear more now. Um, so thank you for that, Axel. And he also sent me a vinyl. It's funny, I've gotten a bunch of vinyl now since I joined the, the, the vinyl community. I guess it makes sense. He sent me something from Bruno Enderly, who I think probably most of the guys that watch my videos know who he is. Um, Synthesist. And uh, he, uh, Axel actually had it signed over to me. So that was real nice. Um, 
I never really play vinyl much anymore. I have a faulty turntable, as I've mentioned. And pretty much when I play vinyl, it's strictly to copy it into my computer so I can listen to it in there, burn it onto a disc, um, and usually copy it as a WAV file. And then I uh, also create an MP3 file and listen to that from my computer, which is where I listen to all my music from. Um, I got a decent pair of speakers on my computer with a nice woofer, tweeters, bass, and all that. Um, but unfortunately, um, I've had this problem with my turntable with one of the channels fritzing out. So I got the entire second side of the album. Each side is a single 22-minute piece. Um, but on the first side, one of the channels drops out for about five minutes. So I'm going to have to go back and redo that again. Very frustrating because you don't know that it's happening until after you're done recording it in real time and you look at the, the file and then all of a sudden you see this straight line, there's no sound on the, you know, the left channel or the right channel, one of the channels for like five minutes. Um, interesting album, very much all electronic keyboards, a little bit of voice at the end of side two, a little bit of speaking. Um, interesting to find out though that Bruno Ender Lee was born in 1971. So, uh, and obviously anybody who's heard him knows he's very, very, very much influenced by, um, Berlin School, Klaus Schultz and people like that. And he seems young to me to be influenced by those guys, you know? I mean, I got into Klaus Schultz in like 1978. So Bruno would have been about seven years old then. Um, so it's interesting that, you know, that he also caught that vibe and got into that music and very much tries to recreate that same vibe, though the, the instruments he uses are obviously very much, you know, sounds from the 90s or 2000s. So it's not, you know, it doesn't sound like a 70s recording, but the experience is very much like that. Um, there's two 22-minute pieces on there, so each piece is nice and long, and you kind of sit and you just listen to them and you get lost in them. I have no trouble listening to 22-minute pieces, thanks to people like Klaus Schultz that introduced me to 30-minute pieces back in the day, back in the late 70s, and then before the CD era. And I went to CD era games, he did many compositions that were over an hour, an hour and 20 minutes, whatever. Most of those don't really sustain interest for an hour and 20 minutes, I gotta admit. But the 30, 30 minute ones he does very much do. Um, talking about Klaus Schultz, but again, that was a different era. Um, so I got used to, with no problem, listening to compositions that go on quite long. It doesn't seem like 22 minutes to me. Um, he's got an incredible output if you take a look at his... Uh, his stuff online, you know, makes a lot of recordings, does a lot of recordings, but I like that, you know, to, to me, I have to listen to, you know, for that kind of music, I really, really want to hear longer pieces. So thanks for sending that to me, Axel, that was quite a nice surprise, came at a time when I was uh, a bit down in the dumps, and um, uh, it was nice, you know, it was nice to get, even though it took me, you know, I... <laughs> I had just gotten a, um, a vinyl days before that, actually, um, which I copied into my computer after clearing off my turntable and um, had recorded the vinyl into my computer, put all the crap that I, have on, that I had on top of my turntable back on the turntable, and literally, literally the next day I get this vinyl and it's like, oh my God, I got to take this stuff off again. So I clear, clear off all the stuff that's piled up on my turntable so I could... Um, listen to and copy over the, the Bruno Enderley. So thanks, Axel. So, what have I been listening to lately? I, I went on a bit of a, um, well, you know, uh, pretty much the only new recordings I've gotten, with rare exception. I, occasionally I have points on my credit card and I'll buy an individual album here and there. Um, but most of the stuff I've been listening to lately has been all the VCLT that people have sent me. And um, uh, if, if you watch uh, some of my old videos, a couple of my old videos I mentioned back when I was unemployed, and will be again soon, I'm sure, um, I got into um, listening to Buddy Rich music. And I had, I had a bunch of albums, I had a bunch of CDs that I bought over the years that I didn't really listen to much. But uh, with rare occasion, you know, I hadn't really listened to Buddy Rich music since... I was unemployed in the early 80s. I went through this period, I don't know why, where I was really wanting to hear Buddy Rich music, you know, the big band era of his from the from the 70s mostly. 
and, uh, you know, occasionally dabbling back in the stuff from the 50s and the 60s, the 60s as well. Uh, mostly late 60s and 70s, uh, up until his passing in the, I guess, late, nine, late 80s, I think he died. Uh, 87, I think, I'm guessing. Um, and I um, hadn't listened to him with these. Every once in a while, I'd pick up a, a CD of his, of an album I didn't have. I would play it, put it back on the shelf, and that was it. But um, I had this like a 30 year gap of really not listening to his music a whole lot. And, you know, six months or eight months ago, whenever it was, I made a video about it. I really got into listening to the Buddy Rich band again. Um, and I, I had a similar thing um, just happen this, this past week uh, with none other than this gentleman here, Bill Evans. Piano player, the piano player below this. This one album I have showed. Um, I guess I first started listening to Bill Evans a few years before he died. Um, I'm guessing around 78 or 79. Um, you know, I was pretty new into jazz. When I first got into jazz, I got into ECM, and then I started expanding out beyond the ECM artists. Um, and into, I guess, some of the artists that influenced a lot of the ECM artists, which Bill Evans did. Bill Evans influenced a lot of jazz pianists, but a lot of musicians in general. Plus, some of the ECM-associated artists played with Bill. Um, Gary Peacock, uh, Jack DeJeanette briefly played drums, uh, Eddie Gomez. Um, and so um, I did see his name mentioned a lot. And eventually I had to pick something up by him. And he was a big influence on, uh, say, a more minimalist, a, a less, slightly less bebop-oriented style of jazz piano. He's still doing the jazz piano thing and playing standards and those wonderful cluster thick chords, but um, a bit more gentle. I mean, he's known as a balladeer, essentially. Um, it's not all he played, but but... This is where a lot of people really picked up on him and where he really shines. And also a bit more impressionistic, quiet, low key, influenced by classical music and, you know, by Debussy and Satie and, and people like that. And I guess in the late 70s, I had gotten into him shortly before he died. This is the sad thing with the, in, you know, before the internet, I didn't know he lived miles from my house. Um, you know, unless you b bought a jazz book, you had there was no information about these people whatsoever. And now you can go on the internet and find out that shit. <laughs> this happened to me a whole bunch of times. A whole bunch of jazz musicians lived within like a, a less than a ten mile radius of my house. Famous people, um, people from modern jazz quartet, Bill Evans, uh, Rudy Van Gelder. Um, you know, people that live like right around the corner from me. Had I known, I would have kept my eyes peeled, especially for Bill Evans, because Bill Evans in the late 70s had a certain look that would probably be fairly easy to pick him out. Um, but I didn't know. He lived a couple towns away in Fort Lee in, a, in a, like an apartment complex there. And um, had I known that, I would have just hung out Fort Lee waiting for this tall guy with the hair and the glasses and the beard and all that stuff to come by. Um, <clears throat> but I didn't find that out until after he passed. Um, so he was one of those unfortunate artists for me that I got into before he died. And then he passed away while I was still a, a fairly new fan of his. I was picking albums up by him already. And um, <clears throat> I have this thing that I've talked about before that I mentioned with artists that I'm into before they die and then they pass away. And it's very difficult for me for long periods of time to listen to their music again. And even eventually when I do... I get somewhat depressed by it. Um, there's this thing that, you know, it's one thing if I, if I discover an artist after he passes away. It's, and I can't explain why, why this is. But if I discover them while they're still around, and I'm listening to the music while they're still around, and then they pass away and listen to the music, I, you know, especially with the obscurity of jazz, because we're not talking about, you know, Michael Jackson or Prince or somebody with a lot of people always listening to the music at any time of day. Sometimes I feel like, gee, I'm the only one listening to this guy at this particular point in time. Um, and when they're alive, you know that there's somebody there that has a memory of this session or that session or whatever, you know. And they were there, and they know even more about the session than I do listening to it. 
And once they're gone, like Paul's tree, famous trio with Scott LaFaro and Paul Motion, um, the whole trio, all those guys are gone now. You know, I was into them when Paul Motion was still alive. Obviously, he passed away in recent years. And Bill, you know. Um, so, but but um, for whatever reason, I don't know why. I've, I've had impulses where, oh, I feel like listening to a Bill Evans record. And for whatever reason, I just didn't get to it, and I ended up putting something else on. Well, the other day, I um, got in the mood to hear Bill Evans, and I put it on. It ended up resulting in me playing literally at least every CD that I have by him. Um, and I pulled out my vinyl, but I don't think it's all of my vinyl I have by him. Um, what I've shown before, this is what I love about the two furs. And even, I don't have this music on compact disc yet. This is two albums. One recorded in late um, 1963, I believe. It was called Trio 64, but I believe it was recorded in late 1963. Yeah, in December of 63. Um, interesting band with Paul Motion on drums and Gary Peacock on bass. It's not really considered one of his better albums. You know, it's not a go-to Bill Evans album that you have to have. Um, because this is period after his regular bassist, Scott LaFaro, passed away in a car accident at a very young age. Um, Paul was a bit uneven maybe for a short time you know he was very very much affected by scott lafaro's death and um you know was trying to keep the trio going but you know didn't necessarily make uh his most profound statements immediately after necessarily um the second album on here is the second duet duo duet album he recorded with the guitarist jim hall originally titled intermodulation and this one, that one was recorded in 1966. Um, and this, this is a reissue. Now, both of those albums were available separately and still are, or are again. But um, this is a 1976 compilation or repackaging of those two albums together, a twofer. Um, and, you know, those twofers were good because those, all those albums had been in print for all those years as individual recordings. And their sales probably slumped off a bit. Maybe they went out of print for a short time. And the record companies decide, why don't we repackage two albums together, make them cheaper than buying the two albums separately, and possibly introduce a new audience to them. And it's nice because you get two different settings. You get the, the trio setting, which was the standard setting that Bill worked in, the best known and probably best loved um, working situation that he had, the working group that was a trio of bass, drums, and piano pretty much his whole career. Um, those are the things, you know, I think people think of that the simple trio as being, you know, when they think of Bill Evans music, they think of the trio. Um, any trio, you know, regardless of who the bass player and the drummer were. Um, and then you have the duet album with uh, Jim Hall, which is nice, but, you know, it's not recorded that well. I'm, I'm, I think the, the, the fact that... Um, 1966, the recording quality wasn't obviously what it is today. Um, but also the engineer, I don't really care for the way... I, I've, I've heard both of the Jim Hall, Bill Evans albums. The playing is fine. I don't really care for the way they were recorded. They're very, very dry. The piano, you know, when you when, when you have a trio and you have no bass or drums, the piano should sound enormous. You know, the bass on the piano should be deep, like a, like a a you know, like an upright bass is. Um, the high end, you know, should, should really be, you know, it should sound like an orchestra. And the recordings back then were, were kind of flat. The piano is just thin, you know, it's just thin sounding. And Jim Hall's guitar doesn't even sound as good as it did at the same time in his recordings, you know. So I think the poor recording method, I should say, or the, the engineering, um, isn't probably as good as... Um, it could have been or would have been if it was recorded later. But it's still interesting. It's probably the reason why I haven't really run out to buy these two particular sessions um, on compact disc. I have a wish list now, after listening this week to, to my Bill Evans stuff, I have a wish list now, and I just added like another 20-something Bill Evans albums that I have to get on CD. Um, most of them are are actually his his last decade. Um, the you know from like nineteen seventy he passed away in nineteen eighty in September nineteen eighty. 
Um, and really, to me, you know, the 70s, right up until his passing, primo stuff. You know, of course, it's helped by the fact that the recording quality is a lot better. Um, and the funny thing is, is this isn't necessarily considered his best period, maybe because, you know, his sound was being more innovated in the early 60s. And people kind of knew what Bill Evans did, so they don't consider maybe his last decade or so as being as imperative to to uh, to, to listen to and to and to get a hold of as his earlier stuff. But I have to disagree. I his '70s stuff to me is my go-to stuff, and I can appreciate his early '60s stuff. And he played on Miles' kind of blue album. Um, but really, that last decade of his life, especially from the 73 on is is really my my go-to stuff with him and there's a lot of variation in there too not just trio albums um and but he was kind of known for the last decade or so as well this is bill evans this is what he does and i don't i think he was underappreciated he was known but maybe underappreciated in that time period and um i was unaware until i uh looked on the internet and, and, and did some reading on him but he was only 51 when he passed away, which is I'm five years older than him now. I got, so 51. I thought he was. I thought he was at least like 65 or so. So 51. Um, very sad. He was quite depressed. He had he had a hell of a life. On YouTube, it's incredible. There's a quite interesting amount of videos. He had one brother, Harry, and um, I knew that he had a brother because he dedicated some some pieces that he had written over the years to his brother. His brother committed suicide uh, about a year before Bill died, and um, Bill had the same producer, Helen Keane, for most of his career. Very rare to have a woman producer in jazz, and they were close friends as well. She knew him very well, obviously, having worked with him since the, since the mid-60s. Um, and I believe it was her that said, or somebody that was close to them, and it may, may have been Helen Keene, that said, um, once Bill's brother had passed, Bill's brother uh, suffered from schizophrenia, believe it or not, and he was actually a music teacher in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which was something I didn't know. So musical talent ran in the family, obviously. Um, but uh, he, he played a bit of jazz too, uh, Harry Evans, but um, he was primarily known as being... Um, the musical educator in schools, and he set up the various school systems in the Baton, um, Baton Rouge, Louisiana area with their music program, you know, whether it be a, a big band or the music education or things like that, until he had to retire due to illness. So he had a career, but um, he actually committed suicide, and Helen Keene said that when, um, once his brother Harry had committed suicide, who Bill was very close to, um, she knew it was only a matter of time before Bill himself would pass away. And indeed, it was only about a year. And I didn't realize that. One of my favorite Bill Evans albums was dedicated to his brother who had just passed away. That's a bit sad to, to you know, to hear. You know, he, he lasted only about a year after that. Died at 51, which is not incredibly old. Uh, going back to the Tufers, though, one of the things, one of the other things I like about the Tufers besides the repackaging of the old complete albums. They're not compilations, really. And, um, you know, the price was they almost always were filled with wonderful liner notes. And because these are repackagings many years after the fact, 10, 15, 20, 25 years later, the liner notes were updated at least, you know, at, in, in this case, it was you know updated in 1976 when this was released. Um, they gave the historical perspective that obviously when the album was new, nobody knew. Would this be a popular album? Would this not be a popular album? Was it important in his career? Was it influential? So I like that, you know, which is why I like DVDs, say, with the, of older movies that have a lot of extra features where they talk about the movie and its importance and its effect on the audience and other people and directors and so and so. I like the historical. Looking back, was this an important album in his career? Was it not? Was it influential? All those kind of things. And all these liner notes are almost almost every two for compilation that I bought in the late 70s and early 80s, which is a lot, um, had these substantial liner notes. And this is probably one of the reasons why, even if I 
had acquired this music on compact disc or when I eventually do, I'm still going to keep the twofer because of these wonderful liner notes, they're dated now, but they're still very accurate in terms of the, the you know, historical importance of these particular sessions because they were written 10 to 25 years after the sessions. So the history book is pretty much written on them now. Not a lot's going to change, you know, going forward from these old sessions. Um, oddly enough, most of my Bill Evans vinyl, I don't have on CDs. The CDs I have are different albums. Um, here's an interesting one that I don't remember anything about, the Bill Evans album. And this looks like it would be an older album, like something from the 50s or so. But apparently this is from about 70 or 71. Um, and it's one of the first instances where uh, it's a trio album again. This is one of the ones that I had to put in my wish list to, to get on CD. Um, Marty Morell is on drums, who is a longtime drummer for Bill in, in the I guess, late 60s, going into the 70s. Um, and uh, Eddie, Go the great Eddie Gomez on bass. I love the way Eddie Gomez plays in Bill's trio. Very much a lead voice. Um, he, he can, and sometimes, you know, he'll do the standard walking bass lines. But a lot of the time, he's just off doing something else completely. And um, Mark Johnson was the final bassist in the Bill Evans trio, who I love dearly. Um, and I love his playing in any ensemble that he's in. But I, I have to give my slight preference to Eddie Gomez as my favorite, e even over Scott LaFaro. Um, who's a very innovative bassist in the early 60s in Bill's Trio. I really love the way Eddie Gomez plays in, in Bill's Trio. So it's Bill, Marty Morell on drums, and um, I forget, Eddie, Eddie Gomez played with Bill for many years, 12 to 16 years or something, a really long, long time as his bassist. Um, this is one of the first albums where Bill also toyed a little bit with electric piano. Very interesting to hear electric piano a lot. It's not what a lot of people want to hear when they hear Bill Evans. Um, and indeed, you know, his electric piano sound isn't as distinctive as his acoustic piano sound. And part of the problem is electric piano keys don't have the delicacy of acoustic piano in terms of touch. Um, but Bill has a lot of albums of him just playing solely acoustic piano, and even a lot of trio albums of his playing, you know, acoustic piano, bass, and drums. So those albums that he did when he did play electric piano i think it's really nice when he you know it's a different it's a different sound it's a little bit more variety to the sound than just acoustic piano upright bass and drums so i really love to hear it so this is one of the albums i think it's about 1970 uh great band marty Morell on drums eddie gomez on bass and also uh, briefly jack dijonette played with bill uh and did a mantra live jazz performance which has been available i think in 68 that was from so jack dijonette playing in bill evans trio is a bit of an oddity because bill evans is known very much for being quiet introspective music and jack dijonette more of a wild drummer i don't have that one yet um and there's uh, that was that that album the montro live in 68 album was the only album that um jack dijonette played drums on but recently Somebody uncovered some tapes uh, from that same period of Jack Dijonette playing, and they, they released uh, another album with Jack Dijonette on drums with the Bill Evans Trio. And um, going ahead to <coughs> one of his later day releases, actually, this came out, these came out, there's a Paris Concert Volume 1 and 2 on the Electro Musician label. I remember when that label started by uh, Bruce Lundvall, I believe. And I remember when the label started, and it was incredible. It was gone. It was a big jazz label. And it was gone in a few years. Um, just, it, it went probably faster than it came. You know, it was a big deal label here in America. And these albums, these two albums sold separately, uh, Volume 1 and Volume 2, on Electric Musician, came out. And um, sh th these came out in... Uh, 80, 1984, so a bit before the compact disc revolution, and um, uh, and four years after Bill's passing. So there's quite a few great albums of his came out after his passing, things that were in the can, you know, back in the studio, live performances. Um, many of my favorites came out actually after he passed away. Both of these were really good, 
and I had to put both volumes again in my wish list. Um, this is one of the ones I want to hear the most, um, again, on, on CD. Uh, again, this is strictly, you know, it's a live thing, but, but I seem to recall, I didn't play it, I didn't put the vinyl on, but um, I seem to recall it's very well recorded. It was uh, recorded in November 1979, um, about a, like 10 months before Bill passed away. Um, strictly Bill Evans on acoustic piano, Mark Johnson on bass, and Joe LaBarbera on drums. That was his final trio, right up until the point when he passed away. I re from what I remember, this was one of my favorites, and I highly recommend it. And Bill made some interesting side ventures. You know, most people, you know, you pick up most Bill Evans albums, they're uh, a trio, piano, bass, and drums. Occasionally he would do, and he did this back in the Verve days, um, too, an album where he had other musicians come in, horn players and things like that. It didn't always work, um, and sometimes it did, but when it did, it was really fantastic. So here's a couple diversions. This one is from um, October, late October, early November 1978. Bill Evans' Affinity with Toots Spielman's on harmonica. Now, I love Toots Thielmans. I love his harmonica player. I'm not a fan of harmonica, the instrument, so much. I like it little dabs, maybe on one song, you know, and I get tired of it real quick. But Toots Thielmans is just so fantastic as a player, and it's such an unusual, sensitive pairing. They're both very sensitive players, Bill Evans and Toots Thielman. So, you know, if and when I am in the mood to hear harmonica, this is one of my first go-to albums, um, and another one that I have put in my wish list. I got it. This, this might even be the next one I pick up when I buy. I remember really loving this. Interesting album, because um, Bill plays electric piano as well as acoustic piano. We got Toots Thielman's on harmonica, Mark Johnson on bass, uh, Elliot Zygmunt on drums, who was... Uh, you know, now I'm not sure if Elliot Zygmunt was his last drummer or Joe LaBarber was his last drummer. He used both. The last the last two drummers Elliot, were Elliot Zygmunt and Joe LaBarber, and I'm not sure which, which one came when. Um, it also has Larry Schneider on tenor sax, soprano sax, and flute. So there's a lot of variety here. It's a five-piece band. You've got Toots on, on harmonica. You've got a sax player who plays flute. You've got Bill playing acoustic and electric piano upright bass and acoustic drums. Um, so there's probably more variety in terms of sound and instrumentation here than on just about all his other albums. So if you're not in the mood maybe to listen to the same exact instrumentation from track to track, or you want to hear Bill do something different besides a trio album or even a solo piano album. And I really like this one. It seems like his earlier forays into using like horn players and stuff like that didn't really work. It sounded like it was the Horn Players album and Bill just supporting him. His later albums, when he brought in other musicians, besides Beyond the Trio, it seems like he figured it out and the sessions worked or, or whatever it was. Now we go to one of my favorite, favorite ones. And I think this was actually the last studio album he ever made. We Will Meet Again. When Compact Discs came out, this was, this is the only one that I actually have on compact disc as well. I had to get this. This is how much I love this album. Um, this one was recorded in August of 79 and was, uh, you know, one of his last studio sessions. A lot of live stuff after this point came out after his passing. Um, this is really, this is to me fantastic. This is potentially one of the, the best albums of his more expanded lineup beyond the trio. Once again, it's got Mark Johnson on bass. You can't, Mark Johnson's great, let's face it, you know. Great young guy, very mature player, considering how young he was when he did these. Joe LaBarber on drums. Larry Schneider, once again, on, on um, saxophones and flute. So Bill apparently liked Larry Schneider's playing very much. And Tom Harrell on trumpet. This is the first time I ever heard Tom Harrell. Now, Tom Harrell's a pretty big deal in jazz, as a jazz trumpeter. But um, this was the first time I ever heard him. And, like, perfect tone. Perfect tone. I was amazed. Um, and very fitting. Well both, well, both Larry Schneider and Tom Harrell, 
they're not, you know, if you know Bill's introspective playing, you know, you wouldn't pair him with a um, John Coltrane necessarily style or a hard blowing saxophone player or trumpet player. And I find both of these guys very much fit in with his more introspective style. They're a little bit more laid back, um, which is maybe why the sessions work, maybe why earlier sessions didn't work. I think he was playing with more hardcore bebop blowing style uh, horn players on his earlier albums when he had horn players guest, and it made Bill sound receded into the background, sound more like a supporting player. These they work. It works. This is what's playing in the background now. Just started, actually. Uh, works, really. There's some more up-tempo stuff on here as well. Um, Bill plays, I don't know if I mentioned, but Bill plays electric piano as well as acoustic piano here as well. So once again, like the last album with Tit Steelman, you get the, you know, there's a lot of variety with the acoustic piano, the electric piano. Um, you know, the, the soprano and tenor saxophones with the alto flute played by Larry Schneider wonderfully, Tom Harrell's trumpet, a lot of variety of sound. And when, you know, Compact Disc came around, the decision always was, and still is, do I repurchase my old albums, um, you know, on Compact Disc, or do I get Bill Evans' albums that I don't already have? This one I had to have on, on Compact Disc, one of the first ones I bought, I bought it right away. Great album, highly recommended. If if you want to hear Bill do something beyond the trio, I mean you have to you have to hear him play in the trio setting. <coughs> so there it is, the compact disc version. No extra tracks or anything, but oddly enough, the original album is almost an hour, is actually an hour long, very long for vinyl. Um, he dedicated it to his brother. I don't, I don't think this even came out until after he died, but the record was in the can, waiting release. Bill did do the dedication of the album to his brother, who had committed suicide. I think, you know, either right around the time of the sessions, I think about the time that the album was actually made, or shortly after. And of course, Bill didn't live much longer than his brother. But this was the first, you know... I had to I had to have this on CD. This is such a fantastic album. And usually, you know, like like a lot of folks, when I want to hear Bill Evans play, I usually prefer to hear him in the in the trio setting. You know, where it's all pretty much Bill and support. But that album is just so good. Here's a really great one. Simply trio. Um, Simply trio setting. You must believe in spring. It's called. Um, and this was another one that was recorded and not released until after he passed away. Um, and it came out, I don't know what year it came out, 81. So it came out a year or two after his pa after Bill, about a year after Bill's passing. Um, I think it was recorded, it was recorded in 1977. So the, the, for whatever reason, this was in the can for a while. Um, which is very strange when you hear, it was actually the first album that I was, the first 34 minutes of this video was this album in its entirety. Um, I was a little upset to realize, I bought this when it came out on CD, um, I was a little upset to realize, well, first of all, it's only a 34 minute album, the original vinyl and the original CD. Now when I take a look, of course, I'm going to have to get it. They expanded the CD. They added three more tracks, uh, you know, 15, 20, 25 minutes more of material. Um, and I'm just, I'm just going to have to get it because it's, this is a great album. Um, Eddie Gomez on bass, Elliot Zygmunt on drums. Very well recorded, 1977. Um, I don't know why the, you know, maybe Bill just did a lot of recording and a lot of things just went in the can. You know, and the record companies were releasing maybe one a year or so. But, uh, man, when you hear this, this is really, to me, what his trio was all about. Great album. Very understated. I have this theory about why Bill Evans is not more popular now. Um, and I'm, I could be totally wrong. But I think amongst people younger than my age, maybe even and younger than me, who are serious hardcore music fans only, which is pretty much just about everybody that watches my videos, I think the more low-key music, quote-unquote, easy listening music, um, 
And things that are more arranged, especially with strings, have a bad connotation to people from my generation. <coughs> Anybody that grew up with rock music from Woodstock and beyond. And I think they have a harder time listening to mellow things that they, in their mind, associate with easy listening than they do with something like free jazz. Um, probably all of us who watch my videos can and have listened to free jazz, even if we don't do it on a weekly or monthly basis. And I think that's because we grew up in an era of hard rock music and maybe listening to that or whatever. So free jazz isn't so hard for us to listen to. But going back to my generation and certainly younger uh, and even a bit older, I think they associate anything that's really mellow and laid back with the music that your parents listen to and it's kind of like, away, away, you know? Um, and I have to learn that's not the case. But, you know, this stuff, especially albums like this, which, you know, are amongst his best stuff, I think, can recede into the background. Yes, they do make great background listening. And if you have somebody who doesn't like jazz, this wouldn't change their mind about it, necessarily. Unless they have big ears, but they'd probably like jazz already if they did. But um, I think you could put this on and it would recede into the background if you wanted it to and not annoy people at very least. And at best, maybe somebody say, hey, that's really pretty and maybe get into it. Love this album. And I have to buy the expanded version. Trio. Simply trio. Acoustic bass. Um, drums and acoustic piano. No electric piano in this one. But strange, this was this was recorded in '77. Didn't was not released until after Bill passed away. And I think that's a killer session. Um, it seems I have a lot of the sessions that are atypical of him. Um, here's another one that came out at the time that it was, you know, that it was recorded. Uh, this was recorded in May '76, and another one, Quintessence. Original jazz classics, it's weird because I always associate the original jazz classics with albums that came out in the 50s. And yet, you know, the original jazz classics came out with this one, and yet the original only came out in, in like 76 or 77. Um, but another atypical session that works with Bill only on acoustic piano, but he's got Harold Land on tenor saxophone player, Harold Land, a player that's been around for years, and Kenny Burrell on guitar. Um, Kenny Burrell. Very much in, you know, Jim Hall mode, you know, Jim Hall, slight West Montgomery combination, maybe. Um, Ray Brown on acoustic bass. I don't, I don't know that Bill recorded much with Ray Brown. And Philly Joe Jones on drums. Philly Joe Jones was Bill Evans' favorite drummer, he said. He said he stands high above any other drummer he had played with. And he, Philly played with him for a while in a trio setting. And was, uh, you know, and he had met him in uh, Miles Davis' group. When Bill played for Miles Davis' group, Philly Joe was originally the drummer. Um, and this one works. You know, and again, these are not necessarily sidemen that have the same mentality. Phil, Philly Joe Jones is a bit more of an up-tempo player. Um, Ray Brown probably played just about anything, you know, but he's from that older generation. Kenny Burrell. Kenny Burrell is a good fit, I think, for Bill Evans because he's he's in that in that same mode, a more contemplative, certainly a mainstream jazz guitarist, but a slightly more contemplative, introspective one than an outright wild soloist. And Harold Lane on tenor saxophone player, they only have on a handful of albums. Um, certainly from an earlier generation as well, just like Ray Brown, but. Um, Really, considering that these guys, you know, reputations, whatever, um, would lead you to believe maybe they're from a slightly different background than Bill Evans. This album really works. Um, from May 76, called Quintessence. Yeah, this is really, yeah, this is really, this is a really nice album, too. And another, another one not typical. Um, one of Bill's... High, most highly lauded albums and highly thought of albums as the two volumes of Bill Evans' trio at the Village Vanguard. Um, a couple different volumes of this um, that came out of this live performance. And this was recorded very shortly before Scott LaFaro died. This was his original trio that he put together 
that he intended on keeping together for, for a long time of Paul Motion on drums and Scott LaFaro on bass. Recorded June 25th, 1961. It was a live album. You know, it sounds really good for a live album from 1961, but obviously the depth of sound isn't there as much, you know, compared to the late 70s albums. But, uh, you know, you could hear Scott LaFaro was somebody that was very much up front and not just working as a supportive player. And you have to take into consideration what bass players did at the time, what they were doing in the late 50s and early 60s. So it was considered quite innovative. You listen to it now, and it doesn't sound like it would have been innovated or like it is, but that's because you've had generations of bass players that came along since then. Um, but it's really good. It's really, you know, essential listening. Bill loved this trio. I still, you know, I still go with, uh, you know, I still have a preference for the Mark Johnson trio, Eddie Gomez trio, um, but um, there's no doubt this is quality stuff, and one of the things Bill absolutely loved himself, it's one of the few albums he said of his own that he did listen to. Um, and uh, <clears throat> a couple of compilations. Um, one is called The Ultimate Bill Evans, a good sampling of his Verve work. If you're not going to go back and buy, he recorded a lot of albums for Verve. And uh, it's a good compilation. Um, interestingly, uh, the tracks were selected by Herbie Hancock. I have another Verve compilation called uh, Bill Evans, The Best of Bill Evans on Verve. And I, when I looked at this, I, I thought, why did I buy two Best of Albums on Verve? Thinking that there was just a lot of the same material recycled. And yet, it's actually, no. There's only one single track that is common to both of these albums. Um, just one five-minute track. Um, so it's pretty much, you know, almost like a two-disc um, sampling of his Verve years, you know, which were which were his early, you know, his early solo stuff. Um, I want to go probably, uh, you know, so from the very late fifties or early sixties to the late sixties, say, definitely goes into the late sixties or sixty-nine. I know it goes up to. I forget where it starts. I want to say very early sixties, like sixty-one or so. Um, but he recorded a lot for Verve. Two not bad albums. A good sampling, if you're not going to pick up all his verse stuff, um, a good sampling of his output there. And me, I'm really f so focused on, really, um, I keep thinking, well, I probably only need a couple more Bill Evans albums. And then when I started looking at his, his output, like I said, mostly for me, from the 70s on, <coughs> till his passing, I'm like, oh, but I gotta have that one. Oh, but I gotta have that one. I came out to twenty something albums. Um, a couple outside of that time period that I'm interested in, really, or primarily interested in, I should say, um, are stuff from the '60s. In 1963, this is very innovative at the time. Bill recorded an album called "Conversations with Myself." This is a digipack, a nice digipack reissue. Um, and what this was, this is very unusual at the time, and even for Bill. This is Bill totally solo, but he plays overdubbed piano. Some tracks have two pianos, some tracks have three pianos. If you know Bill Evans' style at all, he's a very thick, chordal player. So if you're going to overdub him, there's going to be a lot going on. It gets very dense at times, especially when you're talking about three pianos. These are very interesting discs. Um... And he went back in the studio in 1967 and did it again with further conversations with myself. And here's the Digipack reissue of that, which is, you know, we've got really the nice reissue with, you know, the booklet and everything. Um, and these struck me as, you know, Bill was somewhat musically conservative, um, you know, a mostly introspective player. Heavily influenced by jazz, but heavily influenced also by classical music and Satie and Debussy and those kind of things. So that's where his playing comes from. Um, the thing that's so not really known as an out there player. Things that struck me about these two albums, though, this is probably his most outside playing, his most experimental, his most avant garde playing, because with those two and three piano things going on, sometimes there's some weird harmonies going on. And listening back to them as I did this week, it's like, wow, I never realized this is his most out there stuff. It was just his solo stuff. 
I thought these were the only two like this that he did. Now, I just found out that in the early 70s, he did another one, um, a third album of overdub piano. And the interesting one with that is, unlike these are you know, strictly acoustic piano. On that one, he used his electric piano as well as acoustic piano, which again, I had to put that on my wish list. God, God I got to hear that. Um, because that's even that's more colors. I think with like three, even two or three acoustic pianos, when you're talking about a player that plays a lot of big, thick chords, wow, there's a lot of stuff going on there, you know? Um, with the electric piano, the color, tonation is, is, is the color of the instrument. It's almost like a completely different instrument. is different. So I think the combination of him overdubbing acoustic and electric piano from the little samples I've heard actually works even better, at least to my preference. Um, because there is a clear distinction between the two instruments. Um, so I, I, and I didn't realize that album even existed until just this last week. So that third album that he did of um, solo overdubbing, he also did live solo albums of just solo acoustic piano. But um, this Conversations with Myself series, as it turned out to be, was him, you know, overdubbing keyboards by himself. That's a different animal, kind of. And I very much want to get that that third and last one that he did in the 70s. And I think, I want to say it could have been 77, but I could be wrong. Um, where he did the overdubbing, but this time with uh, electric piano as well, which from the little sound samples I heard really worked well. Um, but easily his most out there stuff, eh, out there, you know, in terms of Bill, as far out as Bill got. Um, but I think, you know, Bill's music, most of it, you know, even the trio stuff, even the stuff with bass and drums, it makes great background music, no doubt about it. And, you know, if you want, you can let it recede into the background when you listen to it. But there's so much in there. There's so much richness going on. And just, you know, that for somebody that really hones in and wants to listen to music, um, I don't see how you could not be a Bill Evans fan. And it's weird because it's been quite a long time since I played any of his albums. There's a couple reasons for that. I mentioned before, you know, I've, oh, I've had trouble, more trouble with him probably than a lot of others that, that were artists that I got into when they were alive that passed away. Whenever that happens, it's hard for me to listen to them again. Bill Evans, it's hard, even harder because his music is so introspective. It can easily make you sad. Um, and I think for that reason, it made it even harder for me. It's very easy to put it on and just get down in the dumps because... The music is kind of pretty at times and sad and introspective and your mind definitely starts wondering when you when you hear it. You know, you might maybe at first really be listening to it and then your thoughts just start going. Um, it's it's like a great trigger, trigger album music, you know. Um, and, you know, the last time I heavily listened to Bill Evans was during during the time, really, I think probably the early 80s when I was really on a Bill Evans listening kick. But now, the other day, and I, I spent like pretty much an entire day just listening to his music. Um, and I listened to all the CDs I have of his, and I even went online and found some albums I didn't have that were posted up on YouTube in their entirety. Um, and I think there's also, it, 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 not in a bad way, but in old timey, there's times when you hear him playing piano and it sounds like something from the past, but even beyond when it was recorded, not from the 60s or 70s, but even earlier than that, and stuff that even my parents could have appreciated, a lot of stuff that they could have appreciated, and, you know, associate that with the dim, dark past way, way back there, you know, um, and that kind of can make me a little, uh, I don't know, morose? I don't know. I don't know what the, what the term is, you know? Um, you know, thinking about past and people that aren't around and times that are long gone, um, you know, because there's times when his playing does sound like, yeah, you could have heard this on, you know, on a broadcast in the, or at least something similar to this, you know, in the 50s, you know, the, the his harmonic style and the, the way he, you know, chords and phrases and the, the choice of notes and all that. And I don't mean that in a bad way at all. There's a big link to the past with his style of playing. Um, 
and also, you know, the fact that he was influenced by classical music, which goes back even further beyond the jazz era. Um, so even when his music was new, there to a lot of it, there was not maybe not all of his music, but uh, to a lot of his music, there was always a, a, a bit of a link with the past. You could maybe hear some of his influences of classical music and an older jazz style, you know, with that wonderful courting and that, that harmonic selection that he made that's just so rich. And um, certainly, if you're into the ECM artists that are around recent, you know, now, even young guys, um, and you're into the more introspective acoustic piano things that ECM has been coming out with a lot of, of newer musicians even, not, not just older musicians. In recent years, especially trios, acoustic piano bass and drum trios, there's a lot of Bill Evans in those. And if you're somebody that likes those, hasn't gotten into Bill Evans, uh, you should pick something up by Bill Evans that you can really hear where a lot of these guys are coming from. He remains, surprisingly to me, um, still very influential amongst you know younger generations. Um, and even if it does make me a bit sad to listen to it like it did the other day, um, I'm now in this Bill Evans groove now. And um, like I said, I went in my wish list and I just kept on finding these albums of his that I didn't have. And even a lot of the vinyl that I have, like the Paris concerts that uh, from 79, that I want um, I want on CD, you know? And so obviously, and a whole bunch of sessions that I forgot that he did, um, most, mostly trio sessions, as well as that last session of um, the overdub piano, which I didn't know existed until the other day. Um, so I think I might be in that mode now of listening to him again. Hopefully I can overcome the negative associations maybe that some of the music has. Um, I'm definitely into a more introspective thing when I listen to his music, no doubt about it. But, um, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot of interviews. You can learn a lot about him. Uh, I know I've discovered just the last couple of days quite a lot of interviews uh, with him on YouTube. Not necessarily person to person, but a lot of radio broadcasts. More things to listen to than to watch. Um, and even there was one interview with him and his brother, which I had never seen his brother before. Um, so that was quite interesting. I'm putting a big thumbs up for Bill Evans, and I'm hoping that maybe some of the people aren't quite into him or haven't discovered him, or probably everybody who watches my videos knows him, or maybe haven't really listened to him lately, would um, maybe pick something up and find something that floats your boat in terms of you know solo piano or trio or maybe an expanded lineup. Um, might give him a listen, because to me, he's you know one of those guys that... Um, is a quiet innovator. Not just quiet as a person, but his music was quieter, you know, so it wasn't a screaming, blaring thing saying, this is new, this is different. Um, but wow, you know, he's, I can see, you know, listening again now as I have in the last few days, I can see why he's so loved by, you know, modern musicians and musicians from his time and, and the ones that came along afterwards and why he's cited so often as an influence, even for, guys like Ralph Towner that play guitar and keyboards. Um, see, I know this is going to be a long one. Whenever I get to showing everything I have by a specific artist, I think I have more vinyl of his. Um, I kind of gathered up what I could find. Pretty sure I got more vinyl somewhere. Um, but if I find it, it's just going to be things I'm going to want to have to repurchase again on CD, so maybe I hope I don't find them in a way. Okay, guys, it's a long one. I made I More than made up, I guess for not being here last week. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, thanks for all your comments and for watching and everything. And uh, <clears throat> I'll be back probably within a week or so, you know. Don't know what I'll be talking about yet. But um, then I'll talk about Bill Evans today. And uh, hope everybody's doing well. I'll be back later. Bye-bye.